Hi, guys. Hello. How are you doing? How are you? Nice to see you. Great to see you guys. Good to well, see you. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> nice background, Giuseppe. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I think you know that background better than me. The bait fish in the Maldives, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> the Maldives magic. I wish they were real. Yeah, I wish we were all under the sea right now, but this is maybe the second best thing. <laughs> Michael, I think you just need to unmute. Just in the box. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. How are you doing? Good and you. <laughs> Great, thank nice you. <laughs> all right. Um, Thank you for joining us, um, everyone, um, everyone, all the panelists and everybody that's watching. Um, this webinar is the first of hopefully a few that are taking a slightly different format to the um, older webinars. So we're going to have a panel discussion with some really cool speakers and we're going to have a discussion around a certain topic. Um, so we'll be doing these hopefully every fortnight or so. So keep an eye out for more on our social media channels and elsewhere. Um, so today we have a really cool lineup of speakers to talk about conservation lessons. So we wanted to talk about some of the positives in conservation and how these can help us in the future. So as conservationists and biologists, we're quite used to hearing about all the bad things that are happening in the world. Um, so we want to know from some guys that have been working in the field for such a long time and have some such good experience, what works in conservation, what's, what's been um, some of the positive things that have happened and um, what should we prioritize for the future basically. Um, so I think this is gonna be a really interesting chat. Um, we have firstly Giuseppe. Hi Giuseppe. Hello. Am I saying your name right? You know I always say it wrong. You are doing a pretty good job actually. <laughs> I did a few practices, I have to admit. Okay. <laughs> um, so Giuseppe is a marine conservation ecologist who has worked for um, over four decades, is it, or longer? So yeah. more or less four, four decades is fine. Yeah. Um, to research marine mammals, um, devil rays, manta rays, um, and do all sorts of things like create marine protected areas. Um, Giuseppe came out to the Maldives a couple of years ago and we loved having him out on our research boat and having his wisdom and knowledge and we had a lot of fun with him. Um, so I think he's gonna be a great addition to the panel today. Thank you. Um, <laughs> then we have Dr. Robert Rubin or Bob, I think is preferred. Bob is preferred, good morning. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone in Europe, but good morning, Bob. Um, Bob is a manta conservation legend in um, the Pacific. So he's been researching the Pacific manta rays for a long time, um, especially around Socorro Islands. Is that right, Bob? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so that magical place that, that, that is- magical kind of, place. Yeah, looks incredible. Um, and he founded the Pacific Manta Research Group, but I think Bob's also done tons of research into other um, marine mammals, fish, bats even, is that right? Or seals? Bats and seals. Bats and seals, yeah. So again, tons of experience um, and um, yeah, we're pleased to have him with us today. Thank you, Bob. Pleasure to be here. And then we have Michael Scholl. Um, Michael was the Chief Executive Officer for the Save Our Seas Foundation for seven years. Is that right, Michael? Yeah. Um, so if you haven't heard of this foundation, it's an awesome foundation that works to protect um, and raise awareness of sharks and all sorts of other creatures and ecosystems. Um, and they have an amazing magazine as well that is so beautiful, full of amazing imagery and articles. Um, and Michael's also the founder of the White Shark Trust and has worked tons with sharks and other animals, um, I think, in many cool places around the world. Is that right, Michael? Yes, that uh, was very lucky in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we have three really cool people um, with us today to speak about this um, interesting topic. So I'm super excited to get started. Before we get started, um, I'll just tell you the technical information for the audience if you haven't watched before. Um, this webinar is going to last about, well, up to 90 minutes, so it's going to be slightly longer than usual. Um, we will have time for questions at the end and hopefully throughout as well. So if you have any questions or comments at any time, put them in the Q&A box, which is on the Zoom toolbar on your screen, and they will come through to me and then I can ask them to um, any of the guys throughout the webinar if they're relevant or at the end we'll have a dedicated Q&A section. Um, if the question's for somebody in particular, then just put their name in the question so I know who to ask. Um, 
All right, anything else? As audience members, you're automatically muted and your video is switched off. So don't worry about disturbing the webinar in any way, but you can interact with us through the Q&A box. And we might also launch some polls that you can answer where we wanna learn a bit more about where you've been and what you've seen. Um, and we can integrate these into the conversation. Okay, I think that's it from me. So if you guys just wanna maybe introduce yourselves quickly, um, maybe Giuseppe, you wanna go first? Say hi. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon or morning or night, everybody. And um, I, I think you, Flossie, you already introduced me a little bit, but um, so I don't have much more to say. I'm a marine ecologist, a conservation ecologist. I, uh, I started off um, as, um, as someone very much interested in marine mammals. Um, uh, so I went uh, in my early uh, years, I went to uh, San Diego, where I spent um, several years. Uh, um, and in the end, I was accepted as a student at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. But the condition for being accepted there was that I was not going to work on marine mammals because marine mammals were a little bit of the hippie thing at that time. Uh, that tells you that uh, times have changed because now they are you know, there's some very serious science going on with my mammals with cetacean suspicion. And uh, so um, Dick Rosenblatt, who is going to be my major professor, he's a very famous uh, ichthyologist, unfortunately passed away now. He said, why don't you do something with um, manta rays? There is plenty of them in the Gulf of California, which is just around the corner. And I said, yeah, that's a great idea. So that's what I did, and, and, and in that way, I had to, you know, for the rest of my life, to keep one foot in marine mammal quarters and one foot in uh, manta ray and devil ray quarters. And I think I'll stop here for now. Okay, great, thank you. Um, what about you, Michael? Well, I'm originally from Switzerland, um, which is not exactly a, a place where you'd think um, you would find people interested in, uh, in the ocean. Um, but I was always passionate about uh, yeah about the oceans, about nature in general, and um, and especially sharks. So that was my dream, and um, and uh, I started studying in Switzerland, finished my studies in Scotland, and then uh, I was lucky to to go to Af to South Africa uh, in the in the mid nineties. Um, and strangely, it was a place where very little research was done on live white sharks. Uh, most of the research in those days was done on the, on the dead sharks of the nets. So it was kind of a, the El Dorado um, and uh, basically everything was, uh, was still to be done there. So, um, so I stayed, I, I didn't, when I left, I didn't know how long I would stay. I ended up staying 10 years um, studying white sharks around the island, um, developing a system to identify them, uh, which I called fin printing, basically. Similar to what you do with mantas, um, uh, basically instead of using tags, you use cartography to identify the individuals. And then um, came back to Switzerland, uh, became a teacher for a while, uh, worked uh, for an exploration uh, for an explorator. And then I was lucky to to work for the Save Our Seas Foundation for for seven years, um, and it's basically a, a, a grant giving organization based in in Switzerland. Uh, that concentrates on, on projects on sharks and rays, um, mainly so research and conservation mainly. Um, so it basically kind of allowed me to to tie in, um, yeah, everything that I've done through throughout my life uh, into one uh, into one one yeah <laughs> one place. So yeah, awesome. I'll leave it there also for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What about you, Bob? Well, my background is, is very like that of my colleagues because I'm very old. And so we've had a chance to do a lot of things and be in a lot of places. But I became interested in marine biology by working on Catalina Island in Southern California uh, for four summers. And I went there to learn how to, how to dive. Um, and so I learned how to dive in the sea. Uh, I was never in a pool. And going underwater, I, I saw things that I'd never seen before, of course. And... Um, I was just stunned at the beauty and, and the diversity of the underwater environment. And I asked a, a person on the, on the staff where I was working, um, how do we find out about these things? How, oh, we, we catch them and we send them to Scripps Institute of Oceanography. 
and then they'll tell us what we're looking at. And of course, diving was not very popular at, at that point. We were making wetsuits out of old tires and things. And so uh, we, sent, we sent a few things off and they responded very nicely. And I asked my, my friend who was quite a bit older, I said, well, how, who are these guys that are telling me all this stuff? Well, they're marine biologists, really. And well, do they have jobs? Yes, they, they have jobs. You mean they, they get paid to do this? Yes, they get, they get paid to do this. Well, I want to be one of those. And so that was the beginning of that. I just, I just fell in love with the sea. And uh, the, the rest is kind of, uh, is kind of history. Um, but I became enchanted with the Sea of Cortez by working on, on fish eating bats and, um, and terns, colonies of seabirds. And I learned a, a great deal in the Sea of Cortez and, and on my expositions down there, um, I saw a manta and I had never seen one in the wild before. And I was, I was diving alone. I know you're not supposed to do that, but I was diving alone and I was just stunned. And I said, I need to know about these guys. Who are these guys? So I zoomed home, opened books, and there was nothing. Um, there, there wasn't anything there that I could grab a hold of except a name and, and this, you know, this wonderful creature. And so I think that that was the very beginning. And that was, um, I'm, I shouldn't say this, but that was the uh, late 60s. Um, and um, very few, you weren't alive, you know, so at any rate, uh, and I just thought, well, I think we should look at these. And my first recollection, of course, was their beauty. And I sort of put a word to it and called them uh, flying carpets of ebony silk. And I've used it in, in talks and things a few times. But it's, it's been mantas, other animals have been involved in my, in my work over time, but mantas have pretty much occupied my, uh, my brain for almost four decades. And my first real scientific article that I could learn from was Giuseppe's doctoral dissertation. And I didn't know Giuseppe, but I read it with, with great uh, trepidation saying, oh good, finally somebody has really put something together here. I need to know this guy. And I've known him by spirit for a very long time and we've never met personally. And so this is a really a, a privilege for me to be with Giuseppe. And I know Michael, but only from one occasion. So these are two fine, fine colleagues and I'm looking forward to sharing the stage with them. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Um, and if anyone hasn't watched Bob's TEDx talk, it's super interesting looking at the more emotional side of um, science and the sort of connection that we can have with manta rays, isn't it? So yeah, it's a great talk. Google it if you haven't seen it. Okay, so I think we'll move on to the first question. So the first thing that we wanted to talk about was what the conservation gains have been in your field that you've been most excited about. So be it manta rays or other animals, what are the positive things that have happened? Um, maybe you want to go first, Michael? Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, um, I think, I think uh, my, my colleagues will, will agree. Well, they've even, well, they've got a, a longer history than me in, in this field, but uh, certainly the, the, the amount of knowledge uh, that, ha that we've gained in the last, you know, I would say 30 years uh, in, in marine science uh, is, is probably the, you know, the biggest uh, jump uh, forward. And obviously conservation can only happen when you have, you know, the, the knowledge behind it. Um, and the same with education, you can only educate people and, 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 you know, about a problem or about the situation only if, if you have the knowledge. Uh, so, you know, looking back at, at me, uh, I left, uh, to live in South Africa that was 20, 23 years ago. Um, there was there was very little we knew about white sharks in those days, and um, you know that's twenty years after after Jaws actually came out. And I'm sure I mean I know from these days people had the impression that we knew everything there was to know about white sharks. There were encyclopedias written on on white sharks and. You know, uh, it, it definitely wasn't that, that, <laughs> that was definitely not the case. And, and still today, still today, we don't know, uh, for example, simple things like, uh, you know, where do they mate? Where do they give birth? We, we you know, this would be such a, I mean, it, it's one of those basic elemental questions and we, we still don't know the answer of it. So, and that's white sharks, which everybody knows what a white shark looks like. It's the 
first shark that pops in in your mind. So you can think about the other 1,200 species of, of rays and, and sharks in the world, how little we, can, we know about them. So, but still, knowledge has increased dramatically in the last, I'm going to say 30 years. Um, maybe it's 40 years, but it's, it's, it's less than half a century. Um, so, and I think that's, you know, it's true for, for not just, uh, you know, sharks and rays. It's true for, 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 for many, many animals, probably all animals uh, in that sense. So, so yeah, I think that, that increase in knowledge is, is essential. Um, yeah. I don't know what you, what do you think about that? Either of you have any thoughts on that? No, well, yes, uh, I, uh, I, I can only agree uh, with Michael, of course, and, uh, you know, in, in, in taking the, uh, the impetus from what uh, Bob uh, said just before, uh, in terms of, you know, knowledge of even the small group of, uh, of, of rays that we care so much about, uh, the, the mobulids, like the manta rays and the devil rays, uh, it, it is amazing the amount, uh, not only of attention that these animals have gotten since uh, Bob and I started looking at them uh, a few decades ago. And what is the situation now? And, um, and I think, you know, the number of papers that have come out uh, describing knowledge that has been collected in the field, uh, uh, not just in museums and on dead specimens, uh, that was all also uh, very necessary because at the time we started, we didn't even know what species existed. Uh, it was just a bloody mess around there. There were, you know, hundreds and hundreds of species described. And in fact, there are probably eight or nine now, uh, not because they have disappeared, but because there was some order put in the, into the mess. But uh, this is about as far as the museum work is concerned. But uh, the extraordinary thing is what you, Flossie, have been doing a lot uh, in the Maldives that I've seen with my eyes is going in the water and observing the animals and uh, and understanding what they do, what they need, etc. So this has been an extraordinary development, I think, in my lifetime. But there is another thing I wanted to say, and just going a little bit outside of the of the Devil Ray um, uh, family, uh, is that um, you know there, in spite of you know, we are seeing things that are not doing well in the, the ocean. We cannot say that we can ple be pleased with everything that we are seeing happening with the fisheries and the, uh, traffic and pollution and climate change and et cetera, et cetera. But there are a few things, a few signs that are telling us that things are, uh, you know, they can be turned around and that it's worth fighting for them. And I can give you only one example is the Mediterranean non-seal. The Mediterranean monk seal, it's the, on, one of the most endangered uh, seal in the world, still is. Um, it used to be critically endangered until I think three or four years ago. And now it's been assessed by the Red List as endangered, meaning that it has gone from critically endangered to endangered. And I tell you, we have to be very careful in saying what I'm saying now, but I think the monk seals are coming back. And there is a number of reasons for this to happen, um, including the fact that the, you know, the, the artisanal fishermen who are shooting them because they compete, they break the nets, they eat what they think are their fish, etc. cetera. Um, it's becoming much less important as an economic activities where the monk seals still exist in the Eastern Mediterranean. And they are coming back slowly but surely. So, I did not think 10 years ago that I was going to, um, to, uh, to see the monk seal coming back before I died. And I think I can say that now. And I am, you know, last year I was for three hours with three monk seals frolicking around my boat in Greece. And I was, you know, I, I thought I was dreaming. So this is, you know, I think this is very exciting. So we must keep the fight on. Yeah, definitely. That's very inspiring. Um, what about you, Bob? Have you had any really positive uh, news or, or stories? Well, with, with, with mantas, of course, there's, there are some stories that are developing. Uh, I think one of the most 
interesting and important observations that I could make, and I certainly agree with my colleagues here. Um, I worked on elephant seals for some time, and elephant seals, of course, were on the verge of extinction. There were maybe fewer than 100 in the world in, in, in the Pacific, and they were protected. They were protected by the Mexican government and then later by the, by the United States as well. And they now just exploded. You know, there's so, so many elephant seals, you can hardly get on the beaches in, in some places in the world. And they've extended it well, in the Pacific and they've extended well beyond their evolutionary range. And so we have elephant seals in new places on beaches in, in California and Oregon and maybe up into British Columbia as well that are really, um, have never been there evolutionarily. But the, the beauty of the elephant seal uh, arrangement is that the beaches, of course, are, have been protected and so that elephant seals have a habitat. And I think we would agree, uh, the three of us as we speak, about the loss of critical habitats being one of the most important features of, of conservation biology. And allowing the elephant seals to be on these beaches in the absence of predators, no, no people pre, uh, pred predating, predation, and also grizzly bears and wolves and, and Aboriginal people gone now, um, they've, they've flourished. And so the conditions have changed somewhat and so people can study them. And one of the beauties of the work that's come out of the elephant seal research is that much of the work, particularly the diving physiology and the breath holding and, and so on, has great application to, to the human condition. We used to be joined in the field by people that were interested in diabetes. They were physicians. Um, they were not marine biologists or marine physiologists and also people that were interested in sudden infant death syndrome. Um, again, physicians, not, not people that were biologists because of the way elephant seals operated with breath holding and, and so on. They should have been diabetic and they, and they should have been dying like crib death babies do, but they weren't. And so that research has led to a lot of application in the, in the, in the public sector, in the human sector. And, while all research doesn't do that, this, these are classic examples of, of why fundamental research is important and why the conservation of animals are, of course, important. These are mammals and they have lots of applications to human mammals and, and so on. So that was a great beginning for me as a biologist to see not only the, the pure science, which is startling and surprised us all. We None of us ever thought that seals were diving to those depths and holding their breath for that long, but also because it has application. And so conservation of those animals and other species has paid off in the public sector where people wonder about the application, if you will, of their, of their dollars in, in pure research. And so that's a good story for me and I was pleased to be part of it. Yeah, that's a very exciting story. Um, what about the whales? Because the whales, we're starting to see reports that the whales are rebounding after years of hunting. And, and Giuseppe, I know you've done work with important marine mammal areas. Do you have anything to say about yeah. this? Yeah, well, of course, you know, I gave you the example of the monk seal because it was a species that, you know, it was critically endangered and a very, very limited uh, range, uh, just uh, limited to the Mediterranean and a few places out in the Northeast Atlantic. But yes, of course, the whales are another example. It's a very spectacular example. There are some species like the, uh, the humpback whale, for example, or the gray whale uh, that have rebounded uh, uh, spectacularly since they stopped uh, you know, killing them. Uh, not all of the populations are doing well. For example, in humpback whale, there is a population in the Arabian seas, which is very endangered still, and we might uh, lose, hopefully not. Um, and the gray whales, uh, they're, they're part of the species that, which is on the other side of the Pacific, on the uh, Siberian uh, side of the Pacific, and uh, they're not doing too well either. But in general, the species have come back uh, really forcefully. And uh, in fact, now that you, know, you mentioned the uh, IMA, the important marine mammal areas, this is very exciting uh, uh, work that um, uh, I have been starting with the um, uh, Marine Mammal Protective Areas Task Force of IUCN. And, um, and uh, we had some uh, significant support from Germany and from France and from the Mama Foundation. We were able to identify EMAs now in most of the Southern Hemisphere. And, um, 
And, you know, this is not just a, 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 a technical exercise because, you know, knowing having a map in which, you know, the, the important learning mammal areas are identified and easily uh, accessible by anyone in a very user-friendly format is now allow, uh, enabling um, uh, decision makers, administrators, uh, stakeholders in general to know where, you know, to have to be careful about uh, you know doing things in the oceans because it's an important place for one or more species of marine mammals. So uh, I think it's, it's having you know we started like four years ago, uh, yesterday really, and it's already having traction. The U.S. Navy is paying attention to the EMAs and um, uh, in order you know to make sure that uh, the use of uh, sonar is done in a respectful way. You know at least it's, they they said that. And, um, and, and the European Commission is paying attention. I, I think we are, we are having a very exciting time there. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. It kind of shows the importance of marine protected areas as well. I know the EMAs aren't necessarily marine protected areas, but the marine no. protected areas are slowly but surely increasing in size, aren't they? Yeah, but this is the strength of the EMA that they have no political connotation, no management connotation. No politicians can come to us and say, no, you cannot make, put an EMA here because they come only out of science and how the criteria that the EMA were set for uh, are satisfied by the data. So this is, makes them very, very strong. And then if a government wants to use the EMA or doesn't want to use the EMA, that's their business. But then of course, NGOs can put some pressure. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Bob, how do you think that mobulids are doing in general um, and in the Pacific? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think they're, they're doing reasonably well. You know, the getting counts of them like you might be able to do with gray whales is, is pretty difficult because of the, where they are and, and who they are. But nonetheless, I think they're doing fairly well. They're protected in lots of places. Mexico has done a very good job, I think, with that. Um, it, it could be expanded, but nonetheless, it, there's there's a lot of concern for them, and because they're so beautiful, and I think that's that's part of it. You know, they ha they have such elegance that people are charmed by them. Not only are they interested in them, but they're charmed by them. And so, one of the things that has occurred is that the, the tourist uh, interest in in mobile and grays has increased significantly. When I was first diving with mantis, and I was the only one, so to speak, and <clears throat> Um, now, people pay lots of money, of course, to, to go to these extreme places to, to see them, um, which is another issue that will come up in the discussion probably about how, what that means to the animals. But I think right now, they're doing fairly well. And of course, the, the beauty of, of p conserving those habitats, which is now in question given the short fall of dollars because of the virus and so on, is a problem. But nonetheless, as people come to see them, if that's regulated well and the habitats are conserved, that means economic gain for the countries. And um, if the countries are, are profiting uh, economically, then that's, um, that's a, a great boom for them and it will stimulate greater conservation of habitat and, and so on. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the future of the mobulids. Um, fishing is somewhat of a problem in the world, and, and Michael and Giuseppe know more about that than I do. But um, fishing is is a, is an issue that uh, concerns us because of the habitat, and they get caught in nets and so on. But that's another another item. But I think they're doing fairly well, and I see in certain parts of the world um, that has not fortified my opinion uh, when I see rows of dead mobulids hanging in, on racks in various places. Um, but fishing is a problem. And of course, that's, a, that's an economic problem as well as social problem. Yeah. Um, so lucky that the mantas are so charming, I guess, and so charismatic. And everybody yes. wants to swim with one. Yes, and not hurt them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, I mean, I would say the same for sharks, and I'm sure we all would, but we know that, that a lot of the general public are still very scared of sharks from jaws, from all of that kind of stuff. So what would you say, Michael, about the, the fate of the sharks? Have you seen any really positive 
areas or is it all doom and gloom? <laughs> No, no, they, I think in, in every, well, not maybe not in every, but in, in, in a lot of conservation areas, um, and that's something that I, I always try to, to, you know, to kind of pinpoint and share is there are positive things happening. Mm -hmm. Because if, you know, if 50 years of conservation wasn't bringing anything good, um, at some point we have to kind of like, well, let's all stop. I mean, there's no point to this. So, I mean, there's a lot of good, positive stories of populations, you know, um, well, like the monk seal that Giuseppe just mentioned before, uh, you know, the whales. Um, so, and in sharks also, there are some populations of sharks that are coming back. And obviously the, the awareness is, 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 is greater than ever. Before that, you know, up to maybe 20, 25 years ago, uh, talking about sharks, um, yeah, Jaws was about the only shark that people knew. Uh, and now people are, are much more aware that that there is, you know, hundreds of species uh, that inhabit different habitats, some, you know, in the deepest waters, uh, some, you know, obviously in the tropical waters, some in the Arctic waters, you know, sharks that live probably over 400 years um, living in, 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 you know, in the Arctic seas. And so I think as the awareness is, is much more present also. Um, and, you know, there has been some positive, you know, they, they, you know, traffic is becoming more and more limited, at least in, in theory for many species. Um, and there's more and more uh, marine protected areas. Um, the, some, some countries have banned, um, you know, fishing or, or, you know, the practice of, of basically finning the animals and dumping the, 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 the carcass overboard and just keeping the fins. Um, so th there are very good, very positive things. And I think that's, that's very important, especially in today's world, where you know we are constantly assaulted by the media, by you know, be it on TV, on newspaper, by social media, where unfortunately, you know, we're drowning in bad news, and <laughs> especially at the moment with COVID. So I think it's it's very important that people also are aware and know uh, the, the positive stories and, and that conservation works uh, if applied correctly and if done correctly. Uh, it can really work and you know I've, I was fortunate to go uh, to the Great Bay Rainforest in, in British Columbia and, and spent quite a bit of time with, uh, with uh, cetacean researchers up there and, and they told me that in their 15-20 years that they've been working there at the very beginning there were barely any humpback whales uh, and now it's just it's I mean I've seen you know, I can't even count them how many I've seen. So, but I think you know, maybe the important thing is also to, you know, it's conservation is not fixed in time, meaning the problematics change. Uh, and if I take the example of, of the whales, uh, the bigger problem, you know, 40 years ago with whales was the actual killing and hunting of the whales. Um, now, this, you know, it, there are still certain countries that, that do. Uh, hunt for whales um, but fewer and fewer but there are the other problems now facing the whales and one of one of the biggest ones is probably noise pollution something that was far less important 40 years ago and now you you know in in very remote places you have you know um, huge ships cruising by like basic cruise liners uh, that create you know incredible noise disturbance for animals that are so sensitive to to noise, I mean, to, to sounds, basically. They live through sounds. Uh, they communicate through sounds. So it's, I think it's also important to always uh, uh, look back. It's not, it's not really the, the, the hunting and the killing that for, for the whales uh, that is important. It's more the noise pollution. And obviously, you know, the other sorts of pollution are, are dramatic also for them uh, since they're filter feeding, uh, well, many of them uh, through the ocean, while mantas also, and uh, obviously with increasing... Uh, plastic pollution and so on in the ocean, it, it will have, you know, dramatic effect on them too, so. Okay. So, Michael, uh, sorry, you go, Bob. Well, very quickly, Michael's point is really well made. And um, right now in Northern California, outside of San Francisco Bay and so on, right now there are about 50 blue whales feeding within, you know, visual sight of, of the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, in last October, there were probably 500 humpbacks in Monterey Bay feeding. The, there's lots of krill right now, 
uh, surprising a little bit, but nonetheless. And so the, the numbers are, are, are amazing to me. And I think that that's in part because there's been conservation efforts by the public, not only by biologists, but by the public and therefore by the government, because these creatures are close to shore, you can protect them. And of course, if anybody uh, was to go out and try and harm a whale along the coast of California, there'd be 17 sailboats and people beating the, 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 the pirates, if you will, with spinnaker poles or throwing beer cans at them or whatever they had. So um, the whales are, are, are coming back a little bit and, and that's really encouraging and it's resulting from conservation efforts, I would argue, and Michael and Giuseppe may feel differently or have something to say but I, about this, but I think a lot of the effort has come from the public, from the awareness of people caring about animals. Um, the science is one thing and we need it, but that we've, we've convinced people or at least some people that this is important. And that's of uh, course our message. This, this is uh, so true, Bob. Um, and, and I think we, uh, we, ha we haven't won the war yet on the marine mammals, but uh, we are on the right track. On the other hand, I think there are areas that we should pay much more attention to. And um, the uh, example that immediately comes to my mind is the sharks and ray in the Mediterranean, where they are doing very, very, very badly. And they, they, there's no limelight on them. Uh, there are so many, uh, there are a few species that are endemic. Uh, so once they're gone, they're gone, and uh, and the, and most of the species are not endemic, but are you know ju just uh, isolated populations in the Mediterranean, and there is so much, so many of them that are critically endangered and still fished. Some of them are legally fished and they are critically endangered, and I, I don't just don't understand. And uh, this is true for sharks. This is true for rays. Luckily, the, uh, the, on, the only devil ray of the Mediterranean, which is the spine tail devil ray, it used to be called the giant manta ray, but uh, the giant is not giant at all. We, we found out that it was completely a complete mistake. Uh, it was due to the fact that um, in, in the past, uh, there were some manta rays that came into the Mediterranean and they were mistaken by, by the spine tail uh, devil rays. But anyway, they are not doing too bad. And in fact, uh, uh, I just I'm, I'm just working now at the draft uh, red list assessment um, uh, for for the uh, for the that ray in the Mediterranean, and I think we uh, we we have good good reason for uh, downlisting it from endangered to vulnerable. So that's a good thing. But there are so many other species uh, of uh, sharks and rays in the Mediterranean that desperately need attention. Yeah, and if, if, I, if I can just add something um, to, to what was said before, and, and I fully agree with you. I mean, the Mediterranean is, is one, one place where things are get, you know, being unchecked. But, um, but yeah, when also just coming back to the whales again and, you know, other marine mammals. And, and I think that's often something that is I, I see in the news and then people ask me questions is that we're talking about increase in populations of humpback whales, for example, you know, even manatees and so on. But that does not mean that, you know, if we could go back 5,000 years in time, what we have now is still a very small percentage of what was, uh, you know, before humankind basically uh, started killing everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so yeah. you know, I, I went to Crystal River in, in Florida last year and I was very lucky. One day I didn't see any. And the next day, the, the, you know, the temperature dropped and all the man uh, the, the, the manatees came up the spring. And the next day there were 400 manatees. I mean, I, everywhere you look, there were manatees. But still, it's co compared to when you, when you, when, when you read stories about the first uh, people who set foot in, in well, the first white European people who set foot in Europe, um, uh, you know, you could basically, those, those springs were, were, were filled with mantis. You could walk from one, one, one side of the, of the river to the, to the other by walking on their backs. It, there was just, so even with the whales, they have recovered. I mean, they are recovering. Some of them are doing well, but it's still a very small portion of what, what used to be a healthy uh, population. So I think, yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that, that's very true, Michael, but uh, it, it's not just a matter of numbers. It's, it's uh, also a matter of numbers, as you say. 
but also it's a matter of the quality of the life of the animals that even those that are surviving so and so well, uh, they have now to cope with noise, they have to cope with plastic, uh, and uh, in, in many, and they have to cope with fishery, for example, um, as you remember, in the uh, in this 80s and 90s, there was the big problem of the tuna dolphin uh, fishery of the uh, uh, yellowfin tunas in the uh, eastern tropical Pacific, in which the uh, uh, the fishermen were with the purse saying were encircling the uh, the uh, the school of dolphins, and they knew that under the dolphins there were the tuna, and the dolphins were let go. Uh, many of them died. And, and so there was a big uproar, et cetera, et cetera. Now the uh, technology for f catching the tuna and letting the dolphin go is extremely uh, perfection, so that the actually mortality of the dolphins in the nets has gone down, I think, if I remember correctly, by 98%. But the quality of the life of those dolphins that are, you know, several times in the vast expanses of the Pacific Ocean, it's hard to believe. Several times, each dolphin every, every year is caught, is chased by the fishermen, and they run like crazy because they don't want to be caught, and they are encircled, and then they are left uh, out of the net. You can imagine the, uh, the, the stress and the shock of that, and mothers being separated from the, their young because the young cannot uh, swim so fast. And so, okay, maybe they are surviving uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, this fishery, the coexistence with the fishermen, but what is the quality of their life? And this is the whole of the Eastern Tropical Pacific. We're not talking about the little lake here, north of Milan. So the quality of life that we are living, to, uh, we, are, we are allowing to these animals in many, many uh, occasions is very, very far from what it should be. Totally agree. I agree as well. Yeah, it's interesting what you were saying, Michael, because um, in Callum Roberts' book, he calls this the shifting baseline syndrome. So how people believe that what we have now is normal, and if we get a few more, then it's great. But actually, you know, in the past, we had so many more animals and such healthier ecosystems. So um, yeah, that kind of brings us on to our next question what works in conservation what what um what should we prioritize so if I, I i mean i am an aspiring marine conservationist but there's lots of students watching these webinars and they might be thinking what area would i be the most useful so so what do you guys think is the best way to tackle some of these problems i know this is a huge question but um anyone have any ideas well i i would just throw out a couple quick ones, uh, Flossie, that I think Giuseppe made a, an interesting point about uh, the quality of life, but also in that there are lots of species that are not beautiful and spectacular to attract a lot of tourist dollars and so on, that are really threatened by fishing pressures or whatever they, they may be. And I might argue that one of the important areas of, of conservation work might be directed to some of these, these species that don't enhance your reputation as a scientist. So if, if you're working on big, beautiful, charismatic animals, then um, your name gets put in a newspaper and, and so on and so forth, and they make films and, and, and so on, and, and that's fine. But it, it, takes us, it takes our vision away from lots of animals um, that are really in danger and are really in trouble, and we should give priority to some of that kind of work. And that is to say that maybe funding agencies and so on might say, well, these are the problems that we see and, the, and these are the things that we'd like to work on. And if, there, and if there are some of you scientists types and graduate students and so on that are interested in monk seals or what, whatever the issue is, um, these, are, these, are, these are the questions we need to ask and this is where we need to work. And um, I think that that's a useful beginning I agree entirely. Um, uh, luckily, some of these charismatic uh, species uh, um, lend themselves to have an umbrella effect. So they're, you, you, you protect them, and by protecting them and their habitat, you indirectly protect a lot of other less charismatic little things that have an equal right to life, in, uh, to habitat, 
uh, but it would be much more difficult to fundraise or to even find them to protect them. So that's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a, an important uh, consideration. I had another thing I want to say, is that, uh, you know, in um, normally, you know, the, your typical scientist uh, is a very detached person uh, because science uh, is objective. And um, so you describe, you study, you describe, and then you step back and uh, consider that in a completely cool and uh, an objective uh, manner. Uh, I think that doesn't work anymore. I think uh, uh, there, um, we uh, are the ones that are, uh, you know, we have been working on trying to understand things in nature uh, and nobody should uh, uh, prevent us from also being advocates of, uh, uh, for the, uh, the conservation of what we have been uh, so much interested in. So I think uh, th this is an evolution. Uh, it has not conquered uh, the totality of the scientific community, but uh, it should go in that direction because we are risking that uh, a lot of the animals that we've been studying are going to disappear. And uh, so I think that uh, this is uh, something that I am, uh, I am particularly interested in, in, in discussing with the new the, the young scientists, young people who wants to go in science. I think scientists can effectively cultivate a healthy relationship between scientific objectivity and advocacy without damaging the credibility of science. It's, I think it's a little bit of an art, um, but young scientists should learn this art of having sound science coexist with advocacy in in their own minds. Uh, I, I think this is very important because if we don't fight for this, um, who should? Uh, yeah, okay, we have you know, a lot of NGOs, a lot of portion of civil society that is uh, taking care of, of, uh, of, the, of this aspect of the, of the fight, uh, but I, I, I think scientists should not stay out of the um, arena. You're here. Definitely agree, and I think it's it's it's. Um, I mean, it's while I was with Save Our Seas Foundation. I mean, this is definitely something we pushed. Uh, all all the all the projects we 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 funded. Um, you know that communication is is important, uh, and obviously we pushed. I mean, mo all the projects we funded uh, had a conservation aspect to to it. Um, but yeah, I think fortunately the young generation today is very aware of, and they have tools that didn't exist 15 years ago. So I think in terms of communication and, and trying to inspire people and, and, and so on, it, you know, they're much better at it than, than uh, well, the three of us are, uh, probably. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and I think maybe one point about, about um, you know, conservation is it's still too often, I can't, I don't know how to say it, it's, it's uh, we still have this colonialist approach unfortunately sometimes with conservation and conservation only works if the people who are living in that, in that region are integrated completely in a in a conservation plan so so i think that's that's has for too long been neglected more and more ngos and and so on are now obviously doing it but i think it's something just to keep in mind that this is essential to any any good conservation is that uh, you know if we if setting up an MPA, if you're protecting an area, if you're, you know, if you're dealing with a, with a species that exists only in, in a few places, that, that the people who live in that region need to be fully integrated. And yeah, so I think that's, for me, one of the essential things. And some NGOs, you know, are doing it really well. Um, it's very important. I agree entirely. Yeah. Yes, I, th I, I think that um, in the I worked for the National Science Foundation some years ago, and, and I worked in the Office of Public Understanding of Science, and one of my tasks was to go to newspapers around the country and talk to scientific uh, journalists, if you will. And at that time, this is a while ago, so at that time there were only 11 newspapers in, in North America that had a, a science writer. And in interviewing these folks, none of them 
had more than a bachelor's degree in, er in any area of, of science. And if I were to, I have a little bit more than a bachelor's degree, and if I was asked to uh, write an article on the cosmos or on cancer, I, I, I would be hard pressed to, to do it justice. I might be able to write about the sea a little bit and so on. And so I think that, that scientific journalism and also scientific uh, interest in conservation um, is, is something that we as, as scientists or as educators or as co contributors to the conservation effort need to uh, support. And many labs, uh, many places are doing only conservation work now because that's where the funding is. They've moved away often from, from pure research, if you will. And there's a balance that has to be established here. But nonetheless, um, a lot of people in California, at least, are working on conservation elements or aspects of climate change in the sea and so on that are that are very relevant. And I think that the support and the and the social interest by scientists in scientific communication is something that we we would like to see our graduate students come to understand. Yeah. Definitely. Um, we have had a question that sort of links to this topic on communicating science um, from Heidi. So hi, Heidi. Thanks for watching. Heidi said, what do you think works when it comes to educating through interpretation in zoos, aquariums, museums, or other institutions like this? In other words, what do you think makes people care about nature and conservation and actually go out and do something about it? So I think this is a great question. And would anyone like to have a crack at it? Well, I think we all have some ideas uh, about this, but I, I, I think that um, if there, if people are are convinced that life forms are important, whether they're beautiful or not beautiful, um, they'll protect what they love, and I think that's the issue. I I tell students all the time that doing good science and being successful in in marine biology, at least. Is, is the passion for the work and, and for the world's oceans and the animals. You have to be reasonably bright to be able to do some of the things, but most of it is just coming from your heart. And if you love the work and you love the animals, then you probably will succeed as a researcher or as a biologist. And I think that's the effort. I think in, in the future of the earth, uh, we see it in the hands of children. And I think we should make efforts um, to work at, 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 that, at that level. Um, I know that that's a long way off, but the, the children are, are so interested in animals. And if we can work on those things, uh, they may be much more important than certain things that are taught in, in schools. That's just my opinion. But conservation biology and the beauty of the earth is a, is a heck of a lesson, I think, for young people. One thing that I wanted to uh, add to uh, what Bob just said, which I agree entirely upon, how can you not actually uh, agree with what he said, Bob? Um, in the case of animals that are taken away from their habitat and put in a control environment or captivity or in a cage, if you want to be really clear, I personally must say that I feel very, very discomfortable, very uncomfortable, uh, because I, um, uh, I, I, I am very sad to see an animal that is not, has been taken away from its habitat. Uh, of course, this uh, creates a conflict because then, um, you know, putting uh, the public in close contact with the animals has uh, its value in uh, making the public more, more, you know, feeling stronger about the animal. But I think, uh, you know, there are some more modern ways of, um, addressing this, for example, when animals are being rescued, when um, um, some uh, species that are very endangered are bred in captivity before being uh, released. Uh, um, I think there are many ways in which today one can uh, um, uh, face that problem uh, and making it acceptable to those like me who really cannot accept of seeing animals that are taken away uh, from their uh, natural environment just to, to please the people or even make, make money. You know, this is the way I feel at least. You know, I don't want to preach about it, but this is my feeling and it's a strong one. 
And I think also maybe, you know, um, zoos and aquariums, um, you know, they date back to a time when there was no TV. And today, you know, you can, you can pop in a, a, you know, a Blu-ray 4K resolution Blue Planet series or Planet Earth and, and you know, see the most incredible scenes. So, so I think the, 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 the reason for, for zoos and, and aquariums or at least for you know many species of animals, uh, you know, um, is is not no longer there. Um, and as we can see, I mean, there's fewer and fewer, fortunately, cetaceans in in aquariums now, and, and obviously people are very aware of it. So so. So how without zoos and aquariums, you have the TV, but what about the people that are inland or or will never get the the chance to experience nature? How how do we Sort of make them care well i mean just coming back to me as a as a person from switzerland so you dis your description fits me <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are no aquariums in, in switzerland uh, there's a new one now on fresh water but no uh, no uh, yeah salt water i mean my my first inspiration or inspirations one was i mean in, in my days when i was a kid the only document underwater documentaries that were airing were the Cousteau series which i know if you look at them today you <laughs> there are certain questionable things <laughs> uh, and then the other thing that that probably inspired me the most about sharks specifically um there's a natural history museum you know just a few minutes away from where i live and they have the largest naturalized white shark um in the world it was caught in the south of france and um i remember when i was you know as high as this table um and just basically sitting there and, and looking at it and and then yeah i mean nature is still around us you know wherever we live maybe not in you know well i was going to say in the central part of, of new york you still have a central park but so you know i think it's it's go out uh, and it doesn't have to be the african savannah it can be the forest uh, 10 minutes away uh, you know i think a walk a walk in the forest is 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 inspiring and, and I fully agree with what you said before, you know, passion is, is the most important drive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, the, the one thing I have many students contacting me and, you know, they, I want to become this or that. And I, I, you know, I try to dig in a bit, find out a bit more what, you know, why. Um, if there's no passion, this is not the field you should go into because there's a lot of sacrifices involved and, and it's, it's not going to be easy um but uh you know if you have the passion the reward is there uh so so yeah but yeah also to come back to to your initial question about you know what is important you know i know i'm 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 very glad that different people have different passions uh you know i, I i've got friends who are passionate about going to to symposiums and conferences and, and political uh, meetings and so on to fight for listing some species on CITES and, and, and so on. I'm so glad there are those people. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not one of those. I, I, I think I, I would lose my, my, my calm uh, talking with politicians. So it's, <laughs> so, but I'm very glad some people are doing it and doing it really well. And others are passionate about the science. Um, others are passionate about, you know, there's so many things that, are, you know, that you can be passionate about. And I think, yeah, it, it always comes back to that. So, but yeah, whether you want to become a, a environmental lawyer or, or a scientist or a lobbyist for 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 the environment i mean you know it's we i think there is no one thing that i can tell you do this uh, we need all this to come together uh, by different people and organizations i i think that uh michael i guess i would ask you the question and giuseppe as well um i think we all agree on on these kinds of things we probably don't have much to discuss of our differences here, but are there, are, in your mind, and you've had a lot of opportunity to work with, with very diverse groups of people uh, through SOS and other things, what are the mechanisms, Giuseppe, what are the mechanisms, that is to say, how, how might we proceed in this arena of, is it developing passion or an understanding or a scientific view, or what, what are the mechanisms? How have you been teaching online, as you all know, and it was really a challenge to convey passion and 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 so on. And I'm trying to think about how to disseminate that that sense or that interest 
in, in the public about conservation of, of life forms. It doesn't have to be manta rays. I mean, of course, manta rays are great. Sharks are great. But just the natural world. Do we have any feeling between us about the mechanisms, the sequential steps that we might take? <laughs> Good question. I, and I, I, I don't... <laughs> Well, I don't mean to put you guys on the spot because I'm on the spot. I just get to ask the que that question, but I, I'm stumped by, by that, that question in education. I don't know the mechanisms. We're dealing with a different time and a different, a different population of people. And I, I don't know how you teach if, and you work the way you learned. And, you know, uh, Bob, I, I think, you know, the, um, the, uh, the, the type of people that are your students are just such a tiny drop in the ocean of humanity. Yes. And, and those are not the ones that um, matter most because they are already converted almost. So they, they, when, when you look at the, when you walk in the street, I walk in the street here in Milan already, everybody who I can meet here in Milano is already a tiny portion of humanity. And I feel sometimes that we are so far from being able to reach out to everybody. You know, the people that, I don't know, cultivates tomatoes in the middle of Kenya. I'm just making a stupid example, but just to tell you, you know, the, how, how diverse uh, societies are. And, um, and, and, you know, ideally we should, you know, have everybody agreeing that nature should be preserved. And um, I, I don't know, I think we are uh, probably going full circle and going to the, to the people that are more, uh, the, 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 uh, maybe the indigenous people that are closer to the, uh, to the, to the nature that we are trying to, uh, to, to preserve, uh, maybe, you know, and they, they don't talk our language, they, they don't talk our real language, they don't speak English, but they don't talk our mental language either, because we are so different. Uh, maybe we should, um, we should try to have a greater conversation with them and learn from them, because I think a lot of, 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 of them, if left to their on devices, not with the contamination of the Western uh, civilization, uh, they would probably do a much better job than us in conserving. Um, even though, you know, a Torres Strait uh, Islander might uh, eat a dugong every day, every once in a while. Um, but uh, I think uh, the dugongs are not disappearing because they're being eaten by the Torres Strait Islanders. They're, di they're disappearing because in Mozambique, they are uh, being uh, illegally caught in net or, or they are, uh, you know, exploring uh, oil and gas in their habitat. Uh, so I don't know, I think we should, we should try to see how we can have a more uh, widened communication about the conservation of nature. And of course, then there is the economic uh, interest of the Western world, of course, that's its own problem. That is the, one of the main problems. We've had many discussions over the years. Uh, Michael, I've had these with Guy and, and other of, others of my friends, uh, colleagues, about the, the role of social scientists in, in communicating uh, the, the issues, if you will. You know, do, I've talked to lots of colleagues that are social scientists that seem to have mechanisms and, and ideas about, not about science directly, the way we might think about it, but how to communicate it, how to uh, influence the public opinion. I mean, certainly politicians have these people advising them uh, about, you know, how to, how to campaign and so on. And I just wonder if there's a, a strong feeling among folks, I realize that there's not a lot of interest of including them maybe in, in a scientific lab, uh, but I think they have something to say and they could help this effort. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm sure. It's a, it's a difficult one because I, I think, I mean, as we all know, uh, if I reflect back on my own life, 
um, when you grow older, you become less and less easily influenced. You know, you're set in your mind. Um, so I think coming back to you know what you said before, I mean, kids are are the future. I mean, I again personal experience on my son. Um, he loves sharks and rays. Uh, why? I'm guessing there was some influence from his father. <laughs> and, you know, he'll correct people who make jokes or who basically say stupid things about sharks and, and you'll correct them. And, you know, um, yeah, I'm not saying that he will become a, a shark biologist later on, but uh, I, at least he knows the fact and he's seen them and, and, and you know, he'll be the first ones to, to, to say something if, if something is, is, you know. So I think kids, you know, it's, it's that the disconnect of nature, I think, between humankind with, with nature. And that's what you said before, uh, Giuseppe, is, is yes, people who, who still live very close to, the, to, the nature, to nature will, will understand much better why it's important to, to protect them. I mean, the, the tribe that still feeds on a dugong once a month, um, they know what it, well, what it will mean um, if there is no more dugongs. It's not like they have a supermarket 50 meters away. So, so yeah, I think uh, social sciences are very important. And, and yeah, getting get, basically get out there and get closer to nature. That's yeah. the best, uh, best yeah. way. And especially for kids who, uh, you know, when I, whenever I see kids behind screens nonstop, it's like, no, uh, go outside, play in the garden. I mean, uh, go in the forest. Uh, so I think that's that's very important. That's that's basically what nature inspires people by itself. They they you know nobody needs to tell a person to enjoy a forest. I go into a forest or I jump in the water uh, with, with you know on a on a reef or I'm happy. Um, that's that's life. That's that's you know <laughs> all the rest. Everything else, as COVID has has shown us in the last few months. There's nothing that's really important uh, apart living. Um, yes. And uh, unfortunately, our society and our politicians and our economists are trying to persuade us that, you know, uh, there are other <laughs> things that are more important than living or life. So, yes. Okay. That brings us on to our final um, question before we take questions from the audience. Um, what effect do you guys think COVID is going to have on the environment? So we've seen the newspaper articles of the clear Venice canals, the um, bottlenose dolphins, the life returning. And I, I like to think of the manta rays in Hanifara Bay having a great time without any of us there to disturb them. Um, but overall, do you think that these positive influences are going to outweigh the negative? Um, what do you guys think? Oh, I, I don't know. The, there is one thing that I think COVID has demonstrated is that, um, and, and I think this, uh, you know, everything, what you said, I think it's early to tell, but I, or even the effect of COVID on, on this, uh, our social and uh, systems and on the way we look at nature, I, I don't know, because it seems like uh, this is very likely very, very ephemeral effect. But one thing it has demonstrated, and I think this is really extraordinary, is that it is possible to interrupt environmentally damaging activities in a matter of days if it's needed. And the effects were dramatic. I think uh, they were ephemeral and in fact what this is what I read that everything is now coming back to normal. But what everyone said uh, that cannot be done was done. So obviously in a less dramatic way one day uh, we can think that it can be repeated, uh, this time having the health of the environment in mind. So at least we know that it can be done. Of course, there is an economic cost, blah, 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 you know, everything. But it can be done. And so this idea that many of the other side uh, are having, no, 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 Your environment is beautiful, et cetera, et cetera, but, uh, you know, the economy, the jobs, etc., come first. It's probably uh, you know it can be uh, we can argue against that. We can say well, economy, jobs, etc., very important, but we can do something to reconcile the two things. And I think this is 
this is what really struck me as an important lesson that I got from these three months. I must say, I, I when when you know when COVID you know started and and when we were confined or semi confined, uh, I was really hoping this would be the slap in the face of humanity for much bigger things that are going to come uh, in in the near future. Um, and that lasted for a while until you know it got clear that basically. In Switzerland, um, the calculation is done, and I'm sure it's the same in many other countries. The life of a human being in Switzerland is estimated from birth to death at $6 million. When the economy suffered enough that basically uh, it costed more than that $6 million per, per person, that's when everything was reopened. And that's the difficulty with the environment is it's very difficult to put a price on a healthy environment. Um, you know, what is, how much, you know, a reef, how much money does it, is it worth? Yes, you can calculate how much tourism comes to it, how much fish it, 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 it you know, population it creates, but it's, that's, I think, a bit the, the thing that frustrated me is that in the end, it's, it's all about money. Um, all the yes. decisions of reopening everything is all about money and uh, the lobbyists and the politicians are all on board. So yeah, that slap didn't really come. And I, I feel, I, I am afraid that through the frustration of the last few months and obviously the suffering of many, many people, um, um, people will have a tendency to not want to hear about other big issues because that's it. We've lived through this. We have survived. Uh, we might have a recession coming up. And there's a very nice, uh, well, nice um, illustration that I, I saw circulate on social media, which basically was a, a bunch of people on a little beach with a, with a little wave that said COVID on it. And behind it was a bigger wave that said recession. And behind it was climate change. And behind it, and basically a tsunami wave of, you know, habitat loss, biodiversity loss, and so on. And it's, Basically, when you stand on the beach, you only see the first one um, and you don't see the others. So, so yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a forever optimist um, and I, I really hope that this virus showed how we are part of nature, how something, as, something so small that we don't see it can actually affect all our lives and certainly our, our political, our economical systems. Um, and yeah, maybe people understand that we're part of, uh, of one big ecosystem, one big living ecosystem, um, that we can't just basically take out, take out, take out, but we are just part of it. So, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully it will wake up some people. Um, um, yeah. I think after the virus, we will see that we're living a, a a different way. I'm not sure of all the changes that will occur, uh, but that that the human condition will change. I hope for the better. I think we'll make some adjustments. I think one of the things that we've seen in 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 America is how clear the skies are, and the the traffic has greatly reduced in our part of my part of the world, if you will. And all of a sudden, you know, I read in the papers that the CO2 levels are are now down around the early 1970 levels um, because of the, the way we've had to uh, shelter in place, so to speak. So I think the, the new world or the, <laughs> the post virus, if that's ever going to occur, and that's an interesting concept in itself, will, will bring us some new ways of life. And I remain optimistic. I, I, there is some pessimism when you look at multiple waves and you say, my goodness gracious, we are we have some issues, but um, I, I, I'm optimistic. And I, sometimes I ask myself, why? Um, why what, what brings this great state of optimism in your brain? Is it just folly? And I can't answer it actually, but I'm hopeful. Maybe that's the better word than optimistic. Yeah, it's good to have reasons for hope and hold on to the good things. Okay, I think, Sorry, Giuseppe, do you have something yeah, to say? Yeah, well, that's, we don't have a choice. We must be hopeful. 
Yeah. And uh, because that will give us a strength to fight. You know, if we were desperate, you know, we'd say, well, okay, well, I'm going to be dead in a few years anyway. Who cares? You know, let's enjoy life. No, I don't think that's the right attitude. We, uh, it's, it's good that we have hope uh, because that comes naturally. But uh, if we didn't have it, we should. And uh, because we, I don't think we have an option. Well, and if we don't, that's, that, that's when you have to react and act. Because, uh, you know, I mean, if, if, if something goes wrong in, at your home, you fix it. Um, uh, and we clearly see that there are some things that are very wrong on our home planet. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, I also have my moments where I'm pessimistic. I'm not going to lie. I, I can't, uh, you know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, then there's a, fortunately always like, no, okay, well, this is going to be even further motivation to, to continue work and, and yeah, do whatever we can. Well, when, when you fix it, Michael, at home, um, that's necessity. <laughs> and it may be necessity worldwide, but if, if we fix it for our neighbor and say, oh, yes, I had that problem with my garbage disposal, and I'll, I'll, sure, I'll come over and help you fix it. That's goodwill. And I think that's, that's an effort that we need to establish. It's not being well spoken for in, in America, I'm sorry to say, at this point. But nonetheless, that's the future. I think the recognition that we, we can make a difference um, and that we need to get out of our own house, if you will, and, and reach out. You know, it, we can't change the world, but we can make a difference one day at a time. And that's important to me. Um, and, and, and I believe in that. And if we could sell that idea, um, if everybody did one good thing every day, effort wise, you know, I think that would make a difference for, for animals and for the planet as a whole. Very, very true. Definitely. It's like that quote, I think you have it on your website, Giuseppe. It's, you never, is it never doubt that one small group of people can change the world or make a difference? Something yeah, that like was that. Margaret Mead. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yeah, you see it every day when you're working in small areas and you think, how does this have an impact on the whole world? This, this teaching this kid to swim or protecting this one manta ray. But when everybody's doing some small things, it has a lot of knock-on yes. effects. So. Okay. I think we'll take one or two questions before we wrap up, if that's all right with you guys. We've had some really good questions from the audience. So thank you everyone for sending them in. I think we've answered a few of them naturally. Um, we have one from Aristide. Um, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, bringing it back to sharks and rays. Aristide it says that his team um, works along the coast of Cameroon to promote marine species conservation. They're seeing a lot of killing of rays and they'd like to convince the local fishermen to release them back in the water when they accidentally catch them. What are some of the reasons to give to fishermen to justify why they should protect these species? What is the benefit for the fishers in protecting elasmobranchs in general? Well, Bob, you want to say something? Well, no, I'm happy to speak to that. A little bit. Um, I think one of the benefits of, of protecting elasmobranchs in general is that they have so much to tell us. Um, and I know this is a very difficult thing to explain to, to fishermen that are mad at them for tangling their nets and things. It's difficult to explain to people that animals have ecological niches and things fit together and, and, and so on. Um, but to, to talk about them as having, uh, having information in their biology and in their presence in the marine environment that will give us insights in how to live here um, is really important. It, these are difficult concepts. Uh, you can sell fishermen on beauty, you can sell them on goodwill, you can sell them on caring for their, ch because their children will inherit the earth. And we have been somewhat successful in Mexico with that, with talking to fishermen. Um, uh, they understand that the fishing industry is de in decline, and they understand why. And now the question is, why should we save these animals, and what does it mean for, the, for your little ones? Um, it's not simple, because you have to feel it, and you can't see it. You can't see the result of what your children growing up in a better world 
Um, and that's the selling point, I think, how to, yeah. how to feel it. I, I, I think, uh, you know, I agree. This is a very tough, uh, a very tough thing. But um, in my experience, you know, not all fishermen are the same. Uh, regardless of their uh, education level, regardless where they even know how to read and write, uh, some of them are very ethically, very strong ethically, and they can, uh, um, by themselves, they will not do something that they think is wrong. Uh, they will not kill uh, an animal unless they need to do it. And uh, others uh, would not be so sensitive to these kind of things. And uh, so I think you have to try to, you know, talk to those that you know would be more receptive of uh, a more ecologically friendly or uh, responsible behavior. Um, the, the general uh, reasoning that um, if you don't really need to kill a shark that uh, is caught in your uh, uh, net and is still alive, you should let it go because you don't, you know, you don't do anything with it. Um, and uh, it will actually help the ecosystem to be more healthy. Well, you can, we, you can try with that. I think um, it's, it's a good reasoning. It makes sense. Uh, but I think uh, you should really work with those that are more receptive within the community, the elder that perhaps have seen a lot in their life and they're probably a little more philosophical about the, the, uh, the environment that they've seen changing through their lifetime and they don't want that to see happening. It's a tough one, Aristide. Aristide, I know Aristide, we're, he's, uh, he's uh, recently giving us a report from a very, possibly a very rare endangered mobile eye in this part of the world. Oh, cool. Thank you for watching then, Aristide. Um, Michael, do you have anything to add? No, I think the, the answer was, well, both my colleagues have answered well, but I, I, I agree is to find, you know, you only need one person in that community, uh, and especially if it's an elder or so who has more, you know, who is well respected, um, uh, who can who can basically, because it, you know, it doesn't seem from the question that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's to feed, it's basically just uh, mm -hmm. killing the animal for no, for no reason, and it's dumped over, overboard, I'm guessing. Um, so yeah, there's absolutely no no reasoning there, and, and I think uh, yeah, any living re creature in an ecosystem has a has a reason to be there. Um, so yeah, if it was to feed the community, depending on the fishing, you know, uh, it's not a it's not necessarily a bad thing. But uh, if it's just uh, to release it, might as well release it alive. So find the right person. Yes, I agree. Great. Um, Thank you guys. I think we'll wrap up um, there, but this has been such an enlightening and informative discussion. And we've had a lot of comments from the audience saying, what an inspiring talk this is. Um, thank you for your motivation. We need to be helpful and we need to be ready for action. Um, not helpful, hopeful um, and helpful, I think. <laughs> um, thank you for organizing such an educated, educative webinar. Um, just loads and loads of comments so um yeah thank you so much for for giving us your time giving us your wisdom um and thank you. being here with us today thank you for hey, pleasure thank you gentlemen it was my pleasure to be in in your presence <laughs> same here thank you very much it's been a pleasure uh, well speaking with with all three of you so yes and nice to meet you yes Everybody. yeah <laughs> yes indeed see you again flossy uh, I hope that I can meet you all and you can all meet each other one day soon once we are a bit more free to move around. Um, but Maybe with some, with some manta around. That would be perfect. Some yeah. mantas and like we were saying before, some wine. Yeah, chocolate. <laughs> <The deal. laughs> okay, guys. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for watching the first of our panel discussions. Um, I definitely feel inspired, so I hope everyone watching does too. We're going to have a few more of these coming up in the next few weeks. So keep an eye on our social media channels. And that's at Manta Trust on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as well. Um, and our website is www.mantatrust.org. And you can check out new webinars if you just put the end slash webinars. 
um, and see all of our, our upcoming chats and discussions. Um, is there any groups that we should follow you guys on social media? Um, Bob, you have the Pacific Manta Research Group, that's right, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Anything for you two that the audience should check out? MarineMammalHabitat.org. Okay. And yeah, go uh, on SaveOurSeas.com. Um, there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, material there, and uh, a lot of uh, stories from from scientists and conservationists uh, who who do this for uh, for a living or for and mainly for a passion. So get inspired there. Um, and yeah. Okay. Amazing. Well, thank you again and hopefully see you all soon and hopefully see everyone in the audience soon for another webinar as well. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank, thank you very you much. Guys. My Have pleasure. a great day or evening.